welcome back to the second session of the morning. Our speaker is um, uh, Brian Nguyen, who will be talking about Ren Montgomery's um, some combinatorial problems. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so uh, my talk will be uh, on a bit of uh, different topics uh, with, uh, compared with, I guess, most of the talk in the workshop. So maybe it's a short diversion. I'll, I'll be brief. Right, so uh, yes, as uh, Joel said, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, some uh, combinatorial problems. Since there's a long history of uh, uh, using linear algebra in um, the context of combinatorial optimization, uh, there's a lot of gems in the past and uh, a lot of uh, beautiful development, for example, Rabin and Vagriani, uh, algorithms for matching, or you can get uh, more general problems like major intersections and classical work from Gabo and Sue from 89. So there are a lot of, uh, of algorithms for this problem. And for through many decades of work ever since, uh, we have uh, been able to reduce the running time from for these problems uh, down to basically, uh, basically the time to uh, do a matrix multiplication where n is the uh, side of the input, right? So, uh, so this is pretty great. So is there any uh, uh, room for improvement? So that's the question. And if you think about it a little bit, uh, then uh, there might be a little uh, something unsatisfactory about this running time here. If you look at even this classical problem, uh, like matching and major intersection. So matching is a really beautiful problem. And for that, we do have running time that is proportional to n to the omega. But in the case of matching, n is actually the number of vertices. So that is better than the size of the input to the power omega, because typically the size of the input would be the number of edges of the graph, which is bigger than the number of vertices. Uh, but if you go to the more general version, let me try intersection, then suddenly the best known algorithm uh, has running time, uh, which is the input size to the power omega. Uh, so that uh, there's some mismatch here, right? So matching, we have fast algorithms. May try intersection, we do not, right? So, so maybe there's some, something to, to be done there, right? And given the tremendous re recent progress in um, in uh, sketching algorithms for uh, linear algebraic problems uh, where we have uh, been able to reduce the running time in a lot of cases to the number of non-zero entries of the problem plus uh, uh, this term that depends only on the rank rather than the input size. Uh, perhaps maybe this is the time to revisit these problems in combinatorial optimization and maybe there's more that we can do. So that is uh, the hope, uh, my hope anyway. Uh, so. Uh, well, we, we don't have an uh, answer for, for most of these uh, questions. Uh, so really today, uh, I'm just going to talk about uh, basically a, a small step uh, toward, uh, towards these, uh, these problems. So uh, before we progress further, let me define the basic uh, notions here. So I understand this is a bit uh, left field for, for this uh, audience. So, so let's define what a matroid is. Like, so a matroid is, uh, basically a collection of sets uh, that are a general abstraction for problems in graphs and uh, linear algebra. Uh, so oh, we operate on a ground set of elements uh, and we have certain rules um, that uh, govern the, the sets that are in the matrix. So you can think of a matrix as just a collection of independent sets. So what are independents? Well, uh, we have three axioms. So empty set is independent. Uh, if we have uh, a big independent set, then any subset of it is also independent. And the third property is that if I have two independent sets and one of them is, have fewer elements than the other, then I can always get an element from the bigger set to expand the smaller one and the new thing is still independent. So in some sense, this is uh, an abstraction that generalizes property that you see in uh, linear vectors. So if you, you want to verify it, you can see that it's uh, very, uh, from the very uh, familiar notions of linear vectors and independent vectors. Um, so we can look at a few examples and we'll see that this is actually a, a fairly, a really nice uh, abstraction. Okay. And uh, also we we'll also call the maximal independent set to be a basis. And by this property, the a consequence is that all the maximal independent sets have the same size. 
So an example uh, from the context of graph are the spanning trees. Right? So the items uh, that we look at in the ground set are just the edges of the graph. Right? So these are the elements. And uh, a collection of edges is independent if it has no cycle. And so for example, if we look at the red edges here, uh, then uh, they would uh, be an independent set because there's no uh, cycle among the red edges. If I look at the blue edges here, uh, there also uh, is an independent set because there's no cycle among the blue edges. Right. So uh, again, if you look at the bases, they correspond exactly to the spanning trees of, of this graph. This is uh, an example of uh, a matroid. This is a graphic matroid. And then we could look at uh, linear vectors. And uh, items are just you know, vector in some field. Uh, Right? And uh, the set of vectors is independent if they are uh, linearly independent. And uh, we can also note that this is actually a strict generalization of the graph case that I just talked about, where uh, the graph uh, could just model each of the edges just as simply a vector that have two non-zero entries at the two coordinate uh, where the edge is uh, incident on. Um, and uh, you can verify that when uh, in F2, so when you have a cycle, you add up those edges, you would get a zero vector back. So they're linearly dependent. Uh, so that, that is uh, a generalization of the graph. So this is pretty uh, general model. There are a lot more examples of matroids. So this class of linear matroids, uh, that is matroids that can be represented using linear vectors, is actually very general. It can include a lot of combinatorial problems. So now we have uh, collections of bases. Uh, there are uh, several fundamental questions that are uh, typically asked. And the most uh, common, I guess uh, maybe the easiest one uh, that many people might have seen in undergraduate classes would be the question for the maximum weight spanning trees. So I have now the elements uh, also have weights on them and we would like to compute the, the base uh, of the maximum weight. So the way that we can do it, there are many algorithms, but one of the way is the cross course algorithms works something like this. I initialize to an empty solution, and then I scan all the elements in the order of decreasing weight. Like, so basically, it's a greedy strategy. Uh, if I can add this element while maintaining independence, I'll add that. And I just scan through them exactly once, uh, from the highest weight to the lowest weight. And that will give you the maximum weight spanning trees. So this is cross course algorithm. And interestingly enough, you can generalize this to any matroid. So in matroid, we have weights on the elements. So for linear matroid, I have weights on the vectors. Like so each vector might have some value to me. And I would like to compute the base of the maximum total weight, right? maximum total value. So you can also do the same thing. Initialize to an empty set of vectors, and then I scan them uh, in the order of decreasing weight. If I can add uh, an element while maintaining independence, then I'll do that. And at the end, I'll obtain the maximum weight base. So this is uh, the simple greedy algorithms, and it can compute the maximum weight base of a matroid. So uh, what about the running time? If you look at the abstract setting of a general matroid, then typically we would uh, assume that the matroid is in some abstract object that we can access through uh, queries. So I give you a collection of elements, and the Oracle will tell me, uh, is this set of elements independent or not? Like, so greedy is really efficient because it only uses n queries. So that is probably about as efficient as you can hope for. So, so that is uh, really great uh, in this abstract model. <coughs> now, a lot of the time, people also care about the special cases, right? So for specific matroid, um, for example, if you look at linear vectors again, then we don't uh, actually uh, just talk about abstract oracles, but we actually talk about the running time of these oracles, right? If I give you a collection of vectors, checking if they are linearly independent is not uh, a cheap, op uh, cheap operation. So uh, the problem is that uh, now greedy no longer seem that fast, because if I have linear vectors in high dimension, then uh, in this uh, step of checking independence, could potentially uh, take you already uh, out of the omega time just to check independence once. 
and uh, we have to check uh, every time we try a new element. So the running time is uh, now actually n times r to the omega. Yeah. So is it always assumed that the ground state is finite? Or is uh, yeah, so let's say that the ground set is finite and you already but have one of your examples was on linear vectors, but it's not finite, right? So they are only the vectors that are given to, to you, oh. right? And they have uh, weights. So uh, you need to somehow specify the weights of the... Uh, so you can think of it this way. So I have features that I can buy, right? Your so vectors, okay. right? then they are only a finite list of them that are already given. And I want to find the subset that the maximum value. You can define metroids on... You, you can define on infinite, yes. And that way, but there's no algorithms for that, or there are algorithms for that. Uh, well, you have to uh, then no define really a certain really way to assess right? the weight. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so here, of course, we look at the case where um, yeah, we have a finite number of elements n, and uh, the running time is measured with respect to that. So I'm given a collection of uh, vectors that are already given to me. I cannot just pick all vectors out there. Right, okay, so the running time, uh, if you do the greedy algorithms uh, uh, without oracles, is that actually n times r to the omega, at least naively. So this doesn't seem uh, so good uh, anymore. So the question is, uh, what, what else can, can you do? Right? Uh, because this doesn't look uh, the best possible. It's not obvious why this would be the best possible. So. Uh, in this work, we look at this problem and we show that there is an algorithm actually that can compute the, the output of the greedy, so basically simulate greedy, and uh, compute the maximum weight base of a linear matroid in running time, uh, uh, basically what uh, we set out that, that we want, which is the uh, number of non-zero entries of the representation plus the rank, the omega, but then we also need this uh, term uh, n to the little of one uh, overhead uh, on that, where n is the number of uh, uh, items with the number of vectors, and uh, r is the rank of these vectors. Okay. So this is the size, r is the size of the basis. So this is what uh, we show. Uh, so uh, I'll go over how we uh, obtain these results, and uh, as I said, this is just uh, maybe a first step toward getting the better understanding of these uh, combinatorial problems. So we'll get to that uh, at the end. So let's see, how, how do we do, how do we uh, solve this particular case? So yeah, so checking whether a solution is independent will really take this much time. So in general, it, uh, this seems to be uh, about the right bound uh, for the running time, if we can get it. Um, so the way we do it is we uh, will proceed in two steps. First, we'll get a simpler algorithm when the number of elements is roughly the same as uh, the rank. Uh, and then we'll uh, use that as a bootstrap for the uh, case when the number of uh, vectors is much bigger than the rank. So that is uh, the plan. And the key tools here is, of course, uh, as we uh, would expect, is coming from uh, sketching the rank. So this is... Uh, the, the approach that we, we hope that using the sketching tools, maybe we can get better algorithms for this. And that is where we start from. So what is rank sketching? Uh, so this is uh, from uh, this a really nice paper uh, from 2013. Uh, this author, Chung Quoc and Wu Lao. And the, the, the results as follow. If I have uh, a matrix uh, of size, let's say D by N, and uh, it has rank R, are smaller than both D and N, uh, then uh, we can actually uh, compute a sketch matrix, uh, linear sketch, that preserves the rank. So that is something that I guess a lot of people you know. So the precise parameters is that uh, we also want to preserve a particular set of independent columns. Uh, so basically, you can think of A as the <coughs> maximum width uh, set of columns that we want to preserve. So what we're going to do is that we'll uh, multiply with some sketching matrix on M to obtain a sketch matrix M prime uh, with a smaller number of uh, rows, uh, roughly equal to the number of rank, uh, such that with high probability, we still preserve this uh, set of columns uh, to be linearly independent. And 
At the same time, we do not blow up the sparsity of the input. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the blow up is only uh, uh, constant. Uh, this is only because I want the high probability thing. Uh, yes, so so that that is uh, the the idea. Um, yes, so indeed, the, this blow up is not too important. It it could even be constant. Right. So with uh, these tools, uh, we can proceed to uh, uh, do the easy case first, which is the case when the number of vectors is roughly the same as the number of uh, elements in the basis. So we'll pick uh, basically a constant fraction of, of these. Uh, input vectors. Right? So we do like greedy. Right? We sort all the vectors in decreasing weight. And in greedy, we would go through them one by one and pick uh, as long as they uh, preserve independence. So here we do basically divine conquer instead. Right? So observe that the maximum weight base uh, is basically what we do is that we compute the maximum weight base uh, for the restriction on the first half of the vector, right? Because the greedy exactly just run greedy on the first half and then run greedy on the second half. So the maximum weight base is nothing but just uh, start out with the maximum weight base for the first half of the vectors. And then once you compute the maximum weight base in the first half of the vector, um, basically we contract the problem in the following sense. Like so a contracted problem uh, the and a set is independent in the contracted problem if uh, you take the union um, with the contract uh, contraction uh, it is independent in the original problem right? so basically once we compute the maximum independent set in the first half we take these elements as, as given and now anything else is independent only if it is independent when it's already in, in union with these selected elements in the first half. So basically, this is what we're going to do. We are going to transform the rest of the n over 2 vectors uh, so that uh, they are represented uh, not by the original vector, but uh, in the transform uh, vector over here. So if you work in the Euclidean space or something, you can think of this as uh, uh, rotate these vectors or actually project this vector onto the orthogonal complement uh, of the selected vector from the first half. If you work on a generic field, you do something similar, because it's not really orthogonal complement anymore. But uh, you do something uh, uh, similar to that effect. So you can do this. Uh, and then you compute the maximum weight base of the second half. So that is the divine conquer approach. Right? So we've. Uh, First, compute the maximum weight base of the first half. And then we transform the, the second half using sort of projecting on the orthogonal complement. Not quite, because we're working on the generic field, but uh, something to that effect. Uh, and then you compute the maximum weight base uh, among these uh, transform vectors in the second half. So that is the basic divine conquer algorithm um, for this case. Right? And the running time would look something like this. Right? We have to solve the problem with half of the vector, and then we need to transform the second half, uh, which take about this much time, because we uh, do some matrix operation. And then we have to recursively solve the second half uh, by the maximum weight base of the transform vector. And the running time would be basically dominated by this uh, middle term here. Uh, and then you get the n to the omega. So this, of course, is uh, not quite r to the omega, but uh, because we work in this case where n uh, is order of r, so we are in good shape here. So that is uh, the basic case. Uh, so it's not too hard to do the basic case. But uh, note that uh, this transformation here is really expensive. So we cannot hope to do something like this when we have a lot of vectors. Uh, much bigger than the number, uh, much bigger than the size of the base. So instead, what we're going to do is that we'll um, use a different kind of divine conquer. So now, uh, in this case, uh, what we're going to do is uh, the following idea. <coughs> we'll uh, sort all the vectors again. But now we will divide the, uh, 
Did I get them out? Order. Sorry. I don't know what happened. Awesome. Okay. I think I somehow I, I missed one slide somehow. Yeah, anyway, so, um, so the idea is like this. So I have the, the vector of sorted from highest weight to lowest weight. Right? So greedy would just run through them and add elements one by one. Instead, what we are going to do is that we will divide them into intervals. Uh, and each of the interval, I want to know how many uh, vectors selected by greedy. And um, then, uh, we just keep dividing them further and further. Initially, we only have one interval. But then, as we refine them, we have more and more intervals until we can identify exactly where the uh, selected elements are. So that is a basic uh, strategy. Um, and because the size of the intervals, if the if an interval uh, has uh, very few elements that are being selected, I can compress them using uh, rank sketching. So if an interval has very few selected elements, you can break them up into sub-intervals and compress each of them, and then solve the sub-problem on the compressed intervals. So the compressed problem doesn't tell me what are the vectors to be selected, but it will tell me how many elements selected from each of these, because they preserve the rank. So it preserves how many elements to be selected. You just don't know which one to be selected. You just know how many. And that is enough for us because once we uh, reduce the problem to the case when the number of selected uh, elements is roughly the same as the number of remaining elements, we can use the simpler algorithms to solve that case because we filter out most of the elements that are not selected. So uh, this filtering uh, step takes about log n iterations. So uh, to solve a problem, we need to solve basically log n subproblems. Um, and uh, that, uh, the, the problem is that uh, if you do that, the, the size of the problem actually grow. Because subproblems, right, because we compress them, they'll have fewer vectors, but they'll have non, more non-zero entries. Right? Because when we do the, the uh, matrix sketching, it, the number of non-zero entries actually grow up. So we have to make the recursion depth to be pretty small if you do not want to blow up the size of the problem. And you can make that happen. You can make the recursion depth to be on the order of log log n. So uh, we'll blow up the size of the problem by log n each time. And the size of the problem will blow up by log n to this power. The total running time would be exactly what I mentioned, sparsity plus the rank to the omega times this blow up factor. So that is, a, yeah. No, uh, so that is one part of it, but it also comes from the fact that uh, the for, to solve a problem, I need to solve log n subproblem, and each subproblem has the same number of non-zero entry. Even if it has the same, right, then it still have that log n blow up. Yeah. So, uh, so that is uh, the rough uh, idea of uh, what's happened, because uh, you need to make the parameter work, and it's, uh, it's a bit cumbersome. So I'll just uh, do a very hand wavy version of it. So the, there are a lot of directions coming from here. As I said, this is just the first step uh, in these uh, problems. So one question, you, immediate question you could ask is can you actually get a near linear time algorithm for this particular case? So this is actually a very simple case, so that might be uh, possible. Um, the reason I got interested in this problem is actually because of this uh, Second question, what happened in the more general problems? Uh, for example, the classical problem of the matroid intersection, where you have two linear matroids, you want to find the intersection, uh, which is the generalization of matching. Um, and that is a really curious uh, problem, something uh, like this. So I'm given two matrices, A and B. You want to find a maximum set of indices such that the corresponding columns in the first matrix are linear independent and the corresponding column in the second matrix are also linear independent simultaneously. We find the maximum set of indices. So this is a really uh, curious problem. 
uh, their algorithms uh, with the running time, like I said, n to the omega, where n is the uh, uh, number of columns of these vectors. But uh, is it possible to get something uh, with sparsity plus the rank of the omega? I don't know. And uh, that is a very curious question. So hopefully, someone will resolve it. Thank you. More questions for Hui. Yeah. You explain or give an example of the projecting onto the orthogonal complement in a more general case. Oh, yeah. So, so basically, the uh, what you, what you do is this. So you you take this uh, vector that you already selected, and now you want to project on orthogonal complement. So what you do is you find the maximum uh, rank square matrix of of these things, and then you compute the show complement of this uh, square matrix. And if you multiply the show complement with the rest, it wouldn't have the same effect. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So that's what you do. Okay. More questions? All right. Let's thank Wei again.